the meaning of biblical mountains. The ambiguous use of the term mountain and frequent references as in Matthew to unnamed mountains beg for a working definition. Richard Buxton, a classic scholar, defines mountain in Greek, oros, as, quote, a height outside inhabited and cultivated space, end quote. A mountain cannot be defined simply in terms of physical height. It's important to understand that for ancient people, mountains and wildernesses are not defined in the same way, or mountains and deserts are not defined in the same way, in the same exact way, climatologists or geographers or earth scientists would define these terms. The important element for biblical mountains is its contrast with a cultivated, humanized area. In a specifically Egyptian context, mountain, oros, may signify the desert in contrast with the fertile and cultivable Nile Valley. We wouldn't call mountains not, we wouldn't call that necessarily mountains. The, the, the opposite of the, of the cultivable Nile Valley, we wouldn't necessarily call that mountainous, but ancient Egyptians would. Elaborating this definition still further, Buxton discusses imaginary mountains. These are the frequently unnamed mountains found in ancient stories about deities, heroes, and relations between deities and mortals. In this context, the imaginary mountain seems to have three characteristics. First, imaginary mountains are, quote, outside and wild, end quote. Being outside, mountains are necessarily for outsiders. Shepherds, bandits, and other deviants are associated with mountains. Second, the imaginary mountain is also before that is to say, the imaginary mountain is humanity's first place of habitation. Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 13 to 14. In Eden, the garden of God, you lived. Precious stones of every kind were your covering. Carnelian, topaz, and beryl. Chrysolite, onyx, and jasper. Sapphire, garnet, and emerald. Their mounts and settings were wrought in gold, fashioned for you the day you were created, with a gerub, a cherub. It's like a sphinx-like animal. I placed you. I put you on the holy mountain of God. Wait a minute, I thought Eden was a garden. Well, it was on a mountain, according to Ezekiel, where you walked among fiery stones. The astral prophet Ezekiel seems to reflect such a creation story that located Eden on the holy mountain of God, which can be plausibly linked with Genesis chapter 2, verses 10 to 14, where four rivers are seen to flow out of paradise located on a mountain. Genesis 2, verses 10 to 14. A river rises in Eden to water the garden. Beyond there it divides and becomes four branches. The name of the first is the Pishon. It is the one that winds through the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. The gold of that land is good. Bedellium and lapis lazuli are also there. The name of the second river is the Gihon. It is the one that winds all through the land of Cush. 
The name of the third river is the Tigris. It is the one that flows east of Ashur. The fourth river is the Euphrates. Thirdly, and most relevant to this discussion, the imaginary mountain is a place for reversals. On imaginary mountains, things normally separated are brought together. Isaac's son on the imaginary mountain is being sacrificed. He should die, but a transformation takes place, a reversal. On the mountain, laws are given, and the people, formerly slaves, become God's own people. Things normally separated are brought together on the imaginary mountain. Social relationships and normal social behavior may be reversed on the imaginary mountain. Likewise, metamorphoses take place on mountains. Metamorphoses are processes that collapse distinctions between things. For instance, the transfiguration, which took place on a mountain. Consider also Jacob, who wrestles the angel. Do you see the mountain in the icon? There's a metamorphosis going on there. There is a distinction between humanity on earth and the divine in the sky vault being eliminated, being collapsed. Jacob at Bethel noticed the mountains in the icon where he dreams about the hole in the sky vault and angels ascending and descending on the stairway to sky vault. Again, the distinctions between sky vault and earth between the divine and the human are being eliminated. These, according to the iconographer, are pointing towards Christ, where the distinction between God and man also collapses. Hey, thanks for watching. Just continue the playlist for the next part of the study. If you have further questions, this is good. They will get addressed, so keep watching. If you found value, please subscribe, like, and share. As always, questions, comments, and criticisms are most welcome. God bless you.